Hey there game developers, today I'm gonna to show you three game programming patterns that you need for every game. It doesn't really matter what type of game you're building, these ones just aren't optional. It's really important that you know what these are and how to use them, and more importantly, when not to use them. I'll show you some practical examples with code that you can use in your own projects, and if you're new to design patterns, this should be a great primer. If you're already using patterns, then drop a comment down below and let me know which one you use most. I'm really curious what the winning one will be. But first, this video is sponsored by me. If you like Diablo or League of Legends style top-down multiplayer games, come learn to build your own with my multiplayer mastery course. We're building a multiplayer adventure game with extraction elements like Tarkov. You'll learn how to build a full multiplayer game from scratch where players can choose from the classes that you give them, search for loot, and try to escape without being killed by another player or one of your custom NPCs. On that note, we'll even add dedicated server tooling so you can see and control everything or just take over one of those NPCs. PCs and go kill your players for fun. Also, you can join the optional student calls we have a few times a week. They're a great place to learn more and go deeper into discussions about game development. Today, we actually had a great discussion about design patterns, which is what I want to talk about today. The course covers way more than I can talk about here, though. If you're interested, you can see a lot more with the link in the description or go to game.courses MP. Now let's get started with the patterns. The first pattern we're going to talk about today is the flyweight pattern, which strangely enough gets its name from fighting and boxing. And its goal is to reduce memory waste or minimize our memory usage through reuse. Some existing ways this pattern's already used by the engine are with our GPU instancing, the terrain system, particles, anything that's got a lot of instances of an object uses this pattern or typically uses this pattern, including our own gameplay code. Some of the most common examples you'll see of this are with inventory or item systems and NPCs. Let's take a look at an item example. Here we have a pretty standard item with a name, an icon, an item type that's defined in an enum down here. We got weapon, armor, consumable, quest, and junk. A list of allowed classes that can use this item, a description, a quantity, and a durability. Now when we look at this, there are actually two types of data here. There's data that's common and persistent across all of the items. Let's say I give this item to a player and it's got some number, a quantity, and a durability. Those numbers are going to change from item to item or from player to player that I give this item to. All of the rest of this data is going to stay the same. So if I have 100 items that are all a sword in my game and I use a data structure like this, I'm gonna be duplicating the name 100 times, the item path 100 times, this list of strings, this enum, or any other data that we add to it later. Now let's take a look at how we can use the flyweight pattern to split this data up. Here we've got an inventory item that has that quantity and durability, and then an item definition that's the shared definition. The item definition, I'll hit F12, which is just the hotkey to go to a definition. The item definition is a scriptable object, and this is one of the things that I think is important to mention and why you're going to run into this pattern almost from the start. Scriptable objects are an implementation of the flyweight pattern. They're a way to allow you to specify a single object that everything is going to reference and reuse data on. Here we've got an item definition where I've taken all of those fields off, and now our designers or ourselves can go in, right-click, create a new item definition, and then assign that one time. We'll have one instance of the name, one instance of the path, the description, and all of this other data, and not waste memory. And we also get the added benefit of being able to rename things in a single spot and then have it update and change or change any data in a single spot. And you can even do that at runtime. You can go in and modify the damage on your scriptable item, your scriptable object item. And then while you're playing, it's going to be reading that data. You get the updates immediately. It's a really nice benefit and it makes makes building and debugging your game really easy, or at least a lot better in my opinion. Now another common use for this is NPCs, and you'd do something similar, but split it out even further where your NPC is going to have an item list, and that item list is going to have item definitions, and so on. You build, these, uh, build up these layers so that you can compose the objects without having to recreate and duplicate all of this data. If you had to go in and recreate every item for every NPC that they drop, well, that would certainly be a nightmare. Now there are a couple scenarios where you don't want to use the flyweight pattern, but in general, my thought is, don't really look at it until you've got some reusable data that you're starting to reuse 
often. If you're reusing something and it's get coming up often and a scriptable object seems like it's going to fit well, then consider it. But don't go to it right away. If you only have one instance of an item, obviously avoid the flyweight pattern. And if you have data that's going to change, make sure that that's not part of the pattern or that it's at the right part or the right abstraction layer. For instance, if I've got an item where I want to have some custom description, I might still use an item definition, but then I would move the custom description up to the inventory item and then read a custom description if they have one. Otherwise, fall back to the item definitions description. Yeah, hopefully you get the idea. If you like this pattern, don't forget to thumbs up and hang around for the next one. The next pattern is the one that I think is the most abused, but very important to actually use and use right. And that's the observer pattern, otherwise known as events or sometimes data binding. It's a pattern where one object observes another object for updates or events when things change so that it can react. Let's take a look at a common definition of observables that you probably shouldn't use. Here we have an observable subject that has a list of observers. Their I observer is the interface that they have on them. You can register observers, which just adds them to that list of observers. It could also just be a hash set. And you can unregister them, which removes them, and then you notify them, which just calls on notify. This is exactly what events do in C Sharp, which is why I would say that most of the time you don't need to build this. Instead, you want to use something like an event. And specifically, I like to use actions for my events because then I don't have to create a delegate and add in all of the extra code. So you use a public event action. I typically go with the naming format on whatever changed. And then you invoke that event whenever the thing changed. So if our character takes damage, we modify the health and invoke the on health changed. If we regenerate mana, we of course increase increment the health and mod or invoke the on mana changed. Now we view those from the observers. That was our observable, the player. The observers are things like a mana bar, which just looks at the player, registers for the on mana changed event, and it says plus equals so that it's a listening, it's adding another listeners because multiple things can listen. Down here in the update mana bar, we just set the mana slider to the value that we want. Now multiple things could be listening to this. We could have a mana text that's also listening to this as well. And the event's gonna fire off and it's gonna call the code that's registered in each one of those. I also have a health bar here that does kind of the same thing. But my recommendation, if you find yourself doing this, I, I think that it's important to show this as an example. If you find yourself having a health bar and a mana bar and you look at these two and they're so very, very similar. Well, then you can consider refactoring into something that's not necessarily using an event and going back to that observer pattern like this. Here we've got a stat bar that takes a player and a slider and then has a stat that the player can choose. Here, if I hit F12 on it, you see that it's just health and mana, but imagine we're gonna add a bunch more stats because for health and mana, it wouldn't be worth doing this, but for a bunch of stats, it certainly might. Then we've got in our on enable a register for stat changed. We pass in the stat that we want to register for and then the method that we want to call whenever that stat changed. Here you see that that stat is or that method is named update stat which takes a value and sets our slider. That register method if I hit F12 on it just adds our on stat changed to a dictionary entry or a list that's in a dictionary entry keyed off of the stat. So the first key here is stat, the second key is the method that we want to add for that stat. We add it to this dictionary here, which is a key of stat and a list of actions that pass an int for the parameter type. So we're adding it to that list whenever we call register. In awake, we just make sure that those lists actually exist and instantiate them. And then down in take damage, we call like, hey, look, listeners health one for each. So loop through each of the listeners in the health and invoke its invoke the method and pass in health. For mana, we do the same for mana and so on. So hopefully you're starting to see how this pattern can be used, not just with events, but with other things. Now I did mention that that it becomes misused the most or the, the most abused. And that tends to happen from people firing off events that fire off and other events that fire off other events that fire off another event and so on back and forth until you have no idea where the actual code that called the stuff that you're running came from. This gets really bad when you start to have a problem and you want to debug things and you're trying to figure out what's making something happen. And it also ends up leading to a lot of circular bugs where one event 
triggers some event and then 20 lines down the stack it re-triggers that first event that then triggers that one and then 20 lines down you get the idea end up with an infinite loop or other big big confusing problems so my recommendation when you're doing stuff with the observer pattern is try not to invoke any other events from an event callback. If you're already in an event callback, think like, yeah, should I really be invoking more stuff here? And is that gonna invoke more stuff? If so, try to try to avoid it and try to minimize it. Don't overuse the observer pattern. And also when you have something that's going to update every frame or it's going to update multiple times a frame, don't use the observer pattern. You don't want to observe positions and velocities or stats that are constantly changing. If you have a stat that changes multiple times a frame, you can just pull it, which is the other option. Just read the value from your health bar or whatever thing that you want the data in and do it that way. Observer pattern is great for performance when you're updating things sporadically. You don't know when it's gonna happen and you don't wanna constantly pull the data. And when you wanna allow multiple different things to, to get events and notifications on stuff changing. Not so much for uh, constantly changing data. Now, the, another great use for the observer pattern before I end this one and go on is just with uh, static events for when things spawn. One of my favorite things to do is just add an on character spawn that's static on the characters. Then I know, hey, whenever any character spawns, I can register for this event and know about it and then get some sort of a callback and have, have a way to tie into just about anything that I want. The next pattern we're gonna talk about is the singleton pattern. This is the one that gets argued about, I think the most, and most people disagree with me on, but I think that it's a very useful pattern and I've seen it in pretty much every game that I've ever worked on or seen the source code for. Singletons give you a way to statically or publicly kind of define a single place for a single instance of an object. If I've got one thing in my game, like a prefab manager here or an entity manager in my MMO or a UI manager or something like that, or perhaps a player on my client, or definitely not on a server, but on a client. If I have a, a player and there's only one of them, which there usually is, then a static singleton instance, just like this, where you have a public static, whatever the type is, named instance, and then either an awake method that gets that instance, or if it's not a mono behavior, you go the route of doing a lazy load or a static initializer that gets you the instance of the object. This makes it so that from anywhere in the code, we can call prefab manager, dot instance dot get sprite and grab back a sprite from this list obviously a very small example but you can imagine that you can put whatever type of data you want on here or if you have some other thing that you're trying to access in your game again if there's only one of them a singleton is a really good option now an alternative way to get started with this what i usually do before i go adding a singleton instance is just use the find first object by type this used to be find object by type first or default but there's a new method in there find first object by type that will get you the first one that's in your scene, which is pretty close to having a singleton. It's very important to notice this pattern though and the naming here. Instance and singleton are pretty common names that you'll see for the static thing here, the static instance of it. And it's got a private setter so that it can't be overwritten so that things don't accidentally go prefab manager dot instance equals something. It's not something that is common and happens, but it does happen. People make typos and it gets even more common, I think, with AI generating code, you've got more and more typos. So this is the general singleton pattern. I think that it's very important to understand and use and not be afraid of. It gives you fast, instant memory access to your objects without having to look them up or go dig around. I, I like this generally more than things like a service locator or other patterns where you can inject things, but you're always injecting the same thing. It doesn't matter. A singleton just makes it nice and easy. And it's a pattern that I think you're going to be using constantly throughout your game dev career, whether you like it or not. Now, if you want to learn more about design patterns, leave a comment down below and let me know which one you're most interested in. Otherwise, just hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. And if you want to go deeper into some of this stuff, come join us in the live Zoom calls. Just check out the multiplayer mastery course in the link in the description. Bye.